2012, the North Face 50K, which is in San Francisco, just north of uh, the city across the bridge in the Marin Headlands, one of the worst storms that they've had for this race. It was a terrible storm. The course, the night before at 1 a.m., the course manager sent out an email saying the course has been changed because half of it is flooded, muddy. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for joining me for the latest episode of the Run to the Top podcast brought to you by runnersconnect.net. So last week, we had three guests on for the Unique Events podcast, which was a lot of fun, and I hope you are laughing along with us as the guests all kind of made fun of one another, and of course with me. So if you're looking for a new challenge, you'll really love that one. But today, you know, I was really thinking about how much the world has changed. You know that moment when you're watching a TV show and you can't remember where you've seen the actor before? Rather than it being a thorn in our side for hours, you know, you sit there thinking, where do I know them from? You just Google it and it gives us an answer in seconds, which I think is a good thing for the most part. But actually, sometimes it doesn't give us that, you know, that satisfaction of when you do remember that actor's name and then you feel so accomplished. The Internet era has allowed us to find inspiration everywhere. But the problem is many of the sources of inspiration kind of took it a little bit too far. You know, I'm talking about those Pinterest images that tell us unless we go hard, we might as well not even bother. I wonder how many injuries quotes like that have actually caused. And then, of course, there are those picture perfect people who only show us the good and we end up feeling really bad about ourselves as we just feel like we're never going to be good enough. Well, my guest today is not only taking back the ownership of the word ginger by calling his blog The Ginger Runner, which was a, uh, being called a ginger was actually a, you know, a term used against him. He took it back, but he also has this really real approach to life, which has created this huge tribe around him, all centered around just being who you are. Ethan and I discuss how anyone could build up to a marathon and an ultra, and he even gets me to commit to one <laughs> with dedication and persistence. And why, just because you're not on the podium or at the front of a race, it doesn't mean you lose out. And actually, it probably means you gain so much more fulfillment from running rather than being this over-the-top, hyper-competitive person. You're going to love Ethan. And after this, I'm sure you'll be spending hours watching his gear reviews and other videos on his website. So don't tell me I didn't warn you because you're probably going to spend quite a lot of time there. Oh, and uh, also remember to check out the 2016 Run to the Top survey at runnersconnect.net forward slash listen because I will be listening intently for your feedback just like I did last year. So I hope you enjoyed this episode with our friend Ginger Runner. After a quick word from Endurapax, we'll be right with Ethan. Hydrate naturally by adding Endurapax electrolyte spray to any drink. Endurapax has zero calories, no sugar, no sweeteners or artificial ingredients. Yep, you heard that right. Just the electrolytes you need. Visit endurapax.com and listen out later in the show for a coupon for 10% off. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Ethan. I'm excited to be here, finally. I'm excited to have you. This is really cool. Yes, finally. So for those listening, um, I have been... You could say persistent, or well, let's use that word, but some would even say a little bit too um, too determined to get you No, on no, it. no. Appropriately no? persistent. <laughs> okay, because I have wanted um, Ethan to come on for a while, and uh, so I kept pestering him while he was on all his travels around the world, um, which you're going to hear a bit more about, but um, finally got a time set up, and here we are. So, okay, first I want to kind of begin with your life outside of uh, Ginger Runner, which we'll go on to explain in a minute. So, um, you know, when I looked you up, it kind of said about being a comedian and actor. So do you want to maybe tell us a bit about your life outside of, um, you know, your website? Yeah, sure. Um, it started, uh, my life started many, many years ago. It was, <laughs> really? It was great. Uh, <laughs> no, I, before Ginger Runner happened, uh, I was living in Seattle. I was an art director. Um, primarily working uh, in motion graphics and graphic design. Uh, but on my free time, I was doing improv comedy. So I was performing 
multiple times a week at a at a comedy show up in Seattle, and I just mm-hmm. I loved it. It was my outlet. It was this incredible opportunity to get on stage and and perform in front of uh, hundreds of people multiple times a week, and it was just this uh, it, like this incredible feeling to be able to do something like that. Mm-hmm. And as that evolved, this is like out of college. And as that evolved and I became more of an adult willing to take risks, uh, I decided that I wanted to move to Los Angeles to become an actor and pursue that dream that I'd always had. So made the move down here in about 2007 and uh, took about a year to really get plugged in. Uh, I was doing I was doing motion graphics and editing film trailers the first year I was here. So basically I just transitioned jobs Mm -hmm. to Los Angeles because I wanted to have steady income because being an actor, you know, just, just the best steady income you can possibly imagine. (laughs) Oh yeah. (laughs) Uh, So after a year of doing that, it just kind of began to click and I was going on more auditions and booking stuff and was able to make a living as a full-time actor. Was and, this uh, in comedy? What kind of things are we talking about here? Yeah. I mean, in, in Los Angeles, you really take whatever you can get. Um, I'm not saying porn. <laughs> there was no porn involved. Uh, but it was you know, commercial acting, small roles on television. But uh, as I was booking these roles, and you know, commercials are great. There are thousands of commercial actors that make incredible livings just doing commercials. Like Flo. She- <laughs> exactly. Perfect example. Flo, she's an amazing comedian. She does um, improv comedy and stand-up down oh, here in Los Angeles. But she booked this incredible commercial that I don't know how much she's making, but it is in the millions. There's oh, no yeah. doubt. Uh, so yeah, that's the dream of every commercial actor is to book, you know, one of those campaigns. Mm -hmm. And so I was making a decent living. I was making more money than I did as a full-time job up in Seattle. And I was like, this is it. This is, I'm living the dream. But there was one day, uh, also at the same time, I was kind of building up a sketch comedy YouTube channel and YouTube was brand new at this point. And you could basically just post anything you wanted and you might get a couple of views. You'd be lucky to get any subscribers. This was before YouTube became such a big thing. So I was posting comedy videos and stuff up on uh, on a YouTube channel and things were gaining a little bit of traction. Uh, YouTube reached out and they wanted to bring me on board as one of their new creators, uh, creator spotlights. This was back in 2000. I think it was 2009. All the years are now much together. Mm-hmm. Um, But that was going on simultaneously as just pursuing acting. And uh, there was a point in my acting career when I was sitting in a waiting room in Los Angeles, uh, waiting to go in for an audition. Uh, I had just come um, back from camping and it was an audition for an outdoorsy guy that likes to drink beer. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is this is the perfect audition. I'm so excited. I'm fresh off of camping. I probably still smell. Uh, There's (laughs) it's just going to be perfect. And as I get into the waiting room and I'm kind of sitting there, I look around and there's 15 to 20 other redheaded dudes with beards, all wearing the exact same flannel T-shirt. And when I signed in, I signed in other underneath other dudes named Ethan. uh, (laughs) And I just realized I I'm a dime a dozen here. Like if if a casting director is looking to cast a redheaded comedian with a beard, they have, you know, pick of the litter. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a unique flower um, in that sense. And at the same time, I had that YouTube channel and I had this passion for running and being in the outdoors. Um, I kind of decided, let's try doing this comedy thing with YouTube, but also mixing and running. And that's kind of where the idea of Ginger Runner came from, was to create a brand new YouTube channel. So, so step away from the sketch comedy side of things and just focus on this thing that's been a passion project for so long. And to see if it could become something. Mm -hmm. So I had the daytime job of acting and was able to pay the bills through that. And uh, was really just pursuing this YouTube channel and just having fun creating reviews of gear um, that no one else was really doing. And then it kind of turned into documenting my races and basically for me to go back and rewatch, you know, to to know what the experience was like to run a marathon uh, and to show my kids someday. Um, yeah, and it all just evolved from there, and it kind of turned into a giant snowball. It was, it's pretty amazing how the last few years have have evolved. Yeah, no, I look forward to hearing more about that in just a moment. But how did running like play into this uh, while you were going through that comedian actor, you know, transition? Were, were you always a runner, or was it something you kind of picked up as stress relief, or how did running come into it? I know this is a an audio podcast, so I, I'm just going to let the listeners know that I'm putting quotes around runner. Uh, I started running uh, back in middle school and high school. It was just to 
stay in shape. Um, I've always been kind of a bigger dude, not like fat, but never, I never had good positive body image. I just was like, oh my God, you're the fat kid in school. So be the funny guy. And I was always pushing to be the funny guy and and to try to fit in that way. But I would do cross country. I would do track uh, to try to stay in as you know comfortable shape as possible. Um, I loved soccer. So soccer was always my running outlet. And so any running I'd do on cross country or track was more training for soccer. Um, but I never, like, I never excelled at it. I wasn't mm-hmm. winning any cross country races. I wasn't winning any track meets. Track meets were more about, like, I would just go to throw javelin, really. Yep. <laughs> just sit there and do nothing. Uh, just felt like I was competing in a sport. You know, javelin, I'm not saying is not a sport, but it, <laughs> you know, involves more form than, than strength. Um, and so out of, out of high school and into college, it was always just a hobby to keep myself in check and in shape. Mm-hmm. I ran my first marathon, I uh, believe it was 2001, the Portland Marathon. And I trained a lot for it and thought, this is, this is the biggest thing I've ever done. There's nothing you know, beyond this. And it was one of the best and most horrible experiences uh, running your first marathon. Because you complete it and you go, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. But it also sucks for the last two hours of it. You know, you're just like, what <laughs> yeah. am I doing? This is so dumb. Um, but I always look back and just loved, loved that feeling at the finish line. It took me close to six years to even think about running another one. Um, cause I felt like one and done, right? You run your first marathon. That's it. There's nothing. Why, why bother doing it again? Uh, it wasn't until 2007, eight after I moved to Los Angeles and I needed that uh, ability to stay in shape and I had all this free time. So running just kind of became a thing. And uh, LA is a, was a new city. I had never been there before. So moving to Los Angeles, I felt the best way to get to know it was to run it. Yeah. And you know, the majority of the streets are flat for the most part. And uh, it was just great to be able to run from my apartment at the time towards the ocean and just kind of link up all these, these fun, uh, these fun runs. Yeah. And uh, I picked another marathon to do. And it was the inaugural Seattle you know, the rock and roll marathon. So I trained for that. So this whole time running had just kind of been in the background, but it wasn't until I had moved to Los Angeles that I started to actually enjoy it again. Mm-hmm. And there had been a, a long gap of time um, in between enjoying running and just trying to use it to stay fit. And then moving to Los Angeles and now kind of building this, oh, I, I actually am really into this and I can't go a day without doing some run. And then you had trail running on top of that a couple of years later when a buddy, a local buddy was just like, Hey, let's go run this trail that I always run. I'm like running on a trail. I've only hiked in Los Angeles. There's no trails here. And you, you soon find out that is not the case. Los Angeles is surrounded by some of the most epic, beautiful trails and uh, trail running. Just that's when I found my calling because mm-hmm. it kind of combined my, I grew up in the Northwest. So it combined my love of the outdoors with this newfound passion for running. And, uh, at that point I was, I was hooked. Yeah, no, I've actually, it's it's amazing the amount of people I've heard say that same kind of thing with trail Mm -hmm. running that, you know, they, they enjoyed the running and they enjoy, like you said about the feeling at the finish line and, you know, don't we all love that? And of course, you know, keeping the weight off. I mean, anyone who says that's not a part of their running is lying. So, um, so yeah, but then once they go to trail running, they really see a different side of running. And I've had that with so many people. And I I actually am a little bit excited for the days that I moved to trail running, but, um, that's great to hear. And, and yeah, I would never have thought LA to have all these trails, but, um, other than the only thing that comes to my mind is, is how do you get to the Hollywood, Hollywood sign? I live really close to it. And do you trail? This, is there a trail up to there, or there how do you are, get to it? Yeah, there's. A, it's actually off limits, so oh, okay. I, people will probably call me out. Like you can't. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, there are trails that go to the letters, mm. but there's all these rumors of there's security guards with cameras that zoom in on the letters, and if you get caught, you know it's an eight hundred dollar fine. Um, I've had friends go up there and take photos near the letters. There are little trails that go up there. Mm. I have. I have not done it just because. It's you kind could. of a touristy thing to do, but <laughs> there are really great trails that come up behind it. So you oh, can actually cool. get up above it. 
yeah. and look down on it. And uh, yeah, I do that route fairly frequently because it's it's beautiful and yeah. it's pretty tough too. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I actually lived. I don't know if any even my listeners know this. I lived in Orange County for a year. Um, cool. And there was some beautiful trails around there and just in canyons and stuff. I did did really mm-hmm. enjoy that. So great. So then, okay, so we let's go back to where we were with, um, you know, kind of bringing your passions together here. And so obviously there's a certain reason you called it Ginger Runner, being partly, you know, as you mentioned, the color of your hair and being yeah, a runner. Yeah, not partly. It, it, I have read it. It's fully red. <laughs> okay. yeah. Some people get a bit defensive about these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, um. <laughs> you know, the hist- there is a bit of history behind that. When I was growing up, the term ginger was always used. Yeah in a negative sense. Yeah. Uh, I was, you know, bullied in elementary and junior high school. I'm not going to play it off. Like I was uh, a victim of, you know, bullying crimes or anything like that, but I never, uh, it was always a thing Mm -hmm. being a redhead and being pale and, you know, being a little bit bigger. It just, I was a target. And I think by turning that into comedy and, and kind of letting my comedy fuel uh, my interactions with people, it helped me cope a lot with that. Mm-hmm. And now as an adult, um, a part of me wanted to kind of take back that word ginger. Yeah, like it's still control. It's mm. a little bit of control on it. Um, uh, there's a s- famous South Park episode uh, where they made fun of gingers. And it, it has been the bane of my <laughs> more like teen and adult existence because everyone's like, oh, my God, gingers have no souls. And yep. it's this constant like great joke, totally original uh, you're really making me feel bad, but I wanted to take that word back and mm-hmm. add that spin, add that comedy to it, but still m- make it acceptable. Mm-hmm. And uh, so calling myself the ginger runner was always, it felt, it felt good. It felt like I was kind of taking ownership of it again. Mm-hmm. And I, and I'm guessing that, you know, part of that is, you know, you, what you just said about taking that back, but almost you mentioned about feeling, you know, you had negative body image is- issues and people who listen to this podcast regularly know that I, this is a real area that I'm really passionate about and everyone has body image issues. I don't care if it's like, you know, the, what, what you think is the perfect looking person for a runner, they still have those issues. Um, but I'm guessing the website kind of became almost a place for people like that to kind of, um, say, you know, we all look different. We all have our quirks. We all have our things that we're not confident about. But here I am and here you should be. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of like a place to kind of say, you know, I look different because of X. But you know what? I'm proud of it. I mean, that's yeah. kind of the vibe I got from the website. Would you say that is kind of an alignment or what What are your thoughts on that? I've never, I've never come out right and said, you know, this is a body positive website or any of that kind of stuff. It's, I've, I'm never, I've never been a fast runner. I'm not an elite. I'm never going to win a race. I'm never going to podium in a race. And it's not because, oh, I just can't work hard enough or I'm just, you know, it's not me getting down on myself. It's just me being realistic and also embracing the fact that competitive, that being competitive in the sport is fun and it has its place. I get so much more fulfillment and enjoyment out of having fun experiences, um, and smiling throughout a race. So yeah, I'm a mid packer and I talk about that a lot. And I think that's what people really connect to is, you know, I'm, I'm nothing extraordinary. And uh, I think that people just kind of can relate to that. People can relate to that mid pack mentality of, yes, we might not win a race, but we can still have a blast doing it and we can build this community and we can all be friends and uh, the body side of things, like the body image side of things, I, for sure. I mean, we have all shapes, all sizes, viewing the videos and being inspired by it and inspiring others. I get emails a lot from people mm-hmm. who have talked about weight loss journeys or body image journeys or uh, their own running journeys. And that is amazing fuel to my fire as far as what I want to create and, and that sort of thing. Um, I, if there's anything that I could put out there and maybe this is something I work on in the future. It's, it's that you're absolutely right. Everyone has a body image issue and being in Los Angeles, you learn that real quick. Mm -hmm. You learn that even though they might be the model that's on the cover of every magazine on newsstands, they still don't think that they're beautiful. They don't think that they're fit. There's it's deep stuff. You know, Mm -hmm. everyone has those layers. So if that can help anybody, 
with their own body image to know that everyone around them has the same problems. I think that's probably the most therapeutic part of it. And if I can bring that to the to the website or to the videos in the future, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. that's a big part of it, yeah. No, that's great. And and really good to, you know, put it, the way you put it there was just just great to, you know, sum it up and, and you know, make all of us feel better. Like, uh, you know, I'm nodding along and I'm sure everyone else is too. Yeah. So then someone who lands on Ginger Runner for the first time, what are they going to find? Um, you know, you've told us a little bit about some of the videos, but it's obviously developed since then. And and then what kind of person are you like focused or like targeting towards here? So anyone listening right now thinks, oh yeah, that's me. I mean, we've mentioned a few things just now, but other things. So the website itself, is is it's a, it's a hub, you know, it's a hub <laughs> with lots of different outlets that you can go follow. I really like the video side of things now. So I've always been been a big fan of visual content. I'm not a great writer, so any race reports that I was writing early on in my running uh, uh, running life, um, I would write the race report. I would read it back and go, it just, you know, I can picture it in my head, but it's just not giving me that sense of. Uh, I, I want the viewer or the audience to be able to feel like they're a part of it. So that visual side of things is really where I'm kind of coming at it. And with a bit of entertainment and comedy, you know, thrown in there too. So uh, I want people to see that there is a visual side to this running thing. You know, you might be running through city streets that on a typical day are ugly, but the fact that, uh, you know, someone can run 26.2 miles through those streets and showcase that in video form. Maybe there's some beautiful aspects to that. So uh, I'm always trying to find a cool story to tell uh, visually, whether it's my own race or someone else's race or someone else's FKT, fastest known time around uh, Mount Rainier, for example. There's a there's a video on the channel with someone getting the fastest known time around that. So there's a huge variety of content in addition to gear reviews, which is what started the whole channel. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was l trying to find content, uh, reviews of gear, reviews of shoes, I couldn't find it. Like it just didn't exist, uh, years ago. So that was a, that was a big start to the channel was creating, um, reviews of gear that were visual. So they were video form that were not only educational, but fun. Um, you know, I didn't take myself seriously. I still don't take myself seriously. <laughs> uh, so I think that kind of adds a lighthearted vibe to all of the content mm -hmm. so that's what i hope people find is you know something that they can relate to that's a bit more lighthearted than than the heavy running is serious and it's always emotional you know that mm -hmm. sort of thing which it which is so so important to mention and, and you mentioned that earlier when you were saying about you know being a mid-packer and it's funny whenever people ask me for you know advice with a race the number one thing i always say is have fun and they think wait what are you talking about like you're a, you're an elite you shouldn't be saying have fun but yeah to me like that is the most important thing and if you're not having fun doing it then don't do it so it's, it's great that you're bringing this fun attitude towards everything and i know a lot of our listeners are really into all the products and you know what kind of things do you review um is it you know the typical garmin and you know shoes or is it uh is it you know products for um I'm guessing it's also the, you know, hydration packs and things like that. What what products are you talking about here? Yeah, I mean, you nailed it. So I have all the the GPS style watches and and that sort of thing. They're geared more towards ultra distances. They always like basically anything I review will work for marathon distances below. Uh I definitely review the gear that is um aimed more towards those longer distances. Just it's more durable. You get longer battery life, stuff like that with the GPS side of things. But then also shoes. So I'm doing road shoes, trail shoes, all varieties, uh, hydration packs, whether that's for a road marathon or a road race, if you decide to use one in that case, or trail runs of all distances. Um, yeah, so I try to vary it up as much as possible. And I kind of, I post two videos a week. There's a live show on Mondays. Uh, and then there's the review or film on Fridays. And that can be like last Friday, I did some some road running shoes. And then next Friday, I'll drop a trailer for a new movie that's coming, you know, in a couple months. So mm -hmm. uh, the content's always varied, but it's always um, consistent. So okay. every week, there's two pieces of new stuff. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned about a film coming. Are you allowed to tell us any information about that? This one I can. Yeah, it's um, uh, for those who may not be familiar. Western States 100 is the first 100 mile race uh, that st was started many, many, many years ago up in Northern California. It runs from Squaw Valley to Auburn, which is 100-mile distance through the <laughs> mountains there. 
And it is a gnarly race. It's super hot. Um, it's notoriously difficult. And a lot of the elite runners blow up. In 2006, there was a man named Brian Morrison who ran the race, was winning for the last 50 miles, got to the finish line first. And as he was coming around the finish line, collapsed because he had pushed himself so hard throughout the day and had to be assisted across the finish line. The last 100 feet was picked up by his crew and was like helped across the finish line in first place. Unfortunately, he was disqualified because he was not able to complete the race under his own power by having assistance from from his crew. So over the years, he went back to Western States to compete again. 2007, got sick the week of the race. 2008, fires canceled the race. 2009, uh, got sick again, had serious uh, nutritional issues and was puking for a majority of the race and ended up having to drop. So he had not been able to complete this race in four consecutive years after essentially winning the mm-hmm. race in 2006 but being disqualified. So six year, or 10 years later, 2016, this last uh, July, he was granted special permission to come back and run Western States 100. The film that's coming out is, uh, I, got, I was like blown away. I reached out to him when I found out that he got into the race and was like, hey, I would love to document this. This is something super special and incredibly inspiring. There's, I haven't heard a story like this. And he reached out and was like, absolutely, let's make this happen. So I was very fortunate enough to, to be able to follow him um, throughout his Western States journey, this, this most recent race, 10 years after he was disqualified. Wow. Um, so yeah, that film will be coming out in a couple of months. So you followed him along the, the run itself, or was it the training and the build-up and everything? A little bit of both, okay. mostly for the race itself. Yeah, because he had a lot of life stuff happening uh, before the race. Um, but yeah, it's going to primarily tell the story of his, uh, race itself. Okay. And how did you logistically do that? If it, <laughs> did you, was it like meeting him ahead or did you uh, run with him? I'm, I'm guessing probably not if he was trying to win it or, um... uh, a bit, of, I mean, a bit of both. Mm-hmm. So at this point he wasn't, I don't think he wasn't a- attempting to win the okay. race. The race has evolved a lot in the last 10 years. So you yeah. get a lot of speedy track guys mm-hmm. that are coming to run this hundred mile race. And I mean, every year it seems like the time gets faster and faster. So he wasn't in the race to, to win it. He was definitely just in it to finish it, to finally get it done after 10 years of having that way on him. Um, so yeah, logistically it's a, it's a real tough race logistically to <laughs> crew, let mm-hmm. alone to film. Um, uh, for those who might be familiar, the eight stations are spaced out fairly fairly far for crew access points and just driving on these backcountry fire roads limit how many aid stations you're actually able to to visit you kind of have to pick and choose you know if you're going to go to point a you're not going to be able to go to point b so you'd have to jump ahead to point c you know and you can kind of pick and choose that way um i was also following another runner sage candidate who was yeah. he was going for the win yeah and uh i just recently posted that that film following his day so following two runners who were not close to each other, they were definitely separated by hours, uh, it, it, like midway through the race. It was logistically te- terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, a poor decision to try to follow two runners simultaneously that were so so gapped. But luckily, I had my wonderful wife who was also able to uh, to film and crews for both of the athletes also uh, contributed with footage and stuff like that. So it definitely helped out. Okay, great. And what is the film called? A Decade On. Okay. All right. I will, uh, if it is, you said it was out in a few weeks? Uh, a couple months. Okay, it'll be, all right. It'll be right around when the Western States 100 lottery results are going to be drawn. Okay. All right. Yeah. Then I will encourage people to check that out when it when it does go live. And, um, you know, I'll send out some messages when it does go live. So you can follow my social media for that if you want, or, or Ethan's, of course, which we will discuss in a minute. So... Okay, thinking about ultra marathons, um, you know, you've said you're a mid packer, you're someone who's out there for the enjoyment of it. Um, what would you like to say to any people listening who are kind of nodding along, like, yeah, I'm a mid packer, you know, yeah, I want to enjoy it, but maybe they're thinking, hmm, maybe ultra running is for me, maybe I should give this a try. Maybe they've done a lot of marathons and they're kind of transitioning, or, um, you know, they've they don't have the time to do the specific workouts, but they can get the weekend long runs in, which is, you know, the most important part of ultra running. So what would you like to say to people who are, you know, those mid packers as well, kind of thinking, Oh, I might like to do this. 
I came from a place where marathons were impossible. Like when I started running, it was unfathomable. The distance was dumb. There was no way a human could do it. But you spectate one, you see one, you see that people can do it. People of all shapes and sizes. And that's mm -hmm. what's crazy is anybody can do it uh, with the right amount of dedication and persistence. And after the first marathon, I took a long break, as I mentioned. I came back, did another one. It sucked. I did another one. Sucked a little bit less. <laughs> I did another one. Had a really great day. And did another one. It sucked again. So... I was on this journey where every race was a little bit different. It had its ups, it had its downs, it's lessons to learn and stuff like that. But there was still kind of this, what's next? Like is marathon, is the marathon distance, the pinnacle distance. And when you finally discover that ultra exists, it just opens this entirely new world of weirdness, of crazy, of uh, impossibility. And that was what was real enticing to me. So my advice is if anyone out there has done a marathon or even thinks a marathon is impossible, there is a next step. And it is possible, 100%. If you can train for and run a marathon, you can do a 50K. Uh, yes, it's going to be on trails. It could be in a mountainous, mountainous region. There's going to be lots of elevation change and all that kind of stuff. But it's totally doable. I am a perfect example of someone who never thought in their life that a marathon would be possible, let alone six miles beyond that, let alone 25 miles beyond that or 75 miles beyond that. Like it's possible 100%. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I encourage people to do it because it changed my life completely. Yeah. It sounds cliche, but it did. No, that's, that's great. And, and, you know, uh, it, it's funny. I'm in that stage where, um, when you said that, I thought God, like six miles. Okay. Yeah. You're doing like, like it. 20... I'm gonna, by the end of this podcast, <laughs> I'm going to make sure you log on and sign up for something. Okay. Well, actually, there is. We, my husband and I talked about maybe doing. See, I'm telling you this and telling everyone this, and I haven't even said it to anyone else yet. But there's a 50k um, World Championships that we've we've toyed around the idea of doing. So. There's no more toying. Just do it. <laughs> Just do it. I know. I will. I will. I, I promise you I will. It's, it's sucking me in. I keep bringing up ultra marathons in a, in podcasts so I, I can know. I know it's, it's worth me. it. I mean, it's worth just to like see yeah. because I learned more about myself in my first ultra marathon than I did in my first marathon. Mm. The lessons that I learned from that day, it was, a, I mean, it, I'll make the story brief. 2012, the North Face 50K, which is in San Francisco, just north of uh, the city across the bridge in the Marin Headlands. One of the worst storms that they've had for this race. It was a terrible storm. The course, the night before at 1 a.m., the course manager sent out an email saying the course has been changed because half of it is flooded, muddy. It's, it could get wiped away. So we're, we're basically changing all the courses. Uh, so be prepared in the morning to basically run through a squall, one of the worst storms in the, in the race's history. So as my first race, I'm just like, awesome. This is going to be great. <laughs> so excited. Um, but you, you, you start doing it and you realize, okay, the distance isn't so bad. It's kind of, it's all in your head. Mm. And we talk about, you know, how running is so much in your own head. Ultra running, uh, it, it, absolutely. It is a mind game. Um, and it is, it is this amazing feeling when you've crossed that finish line for the first time you realize just how much control you have over your own mind, over your own negativity and self-doubt. You can control it. It's just a matter of starting, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm okay. going to tell you right now, you should sign up. <laughs> it's yes, pretty <laughs> um, So then you said about your, your thoughts controlling your mind. Is it the same kind of thoughts you have in a marathon? Like, I can't do this. This is so hard. I can't believe I have this far to go. Why am I doing this? Why do I do this to myself? Or is it different thoughts kind of like... Just, I don't know, are there, what are the, is it the same mindset you have or? Here, this is, uh, it's a pretty key difference. The, the thoughts are the same. So in a marathon, I had a real bad, my, my last road marathon, I haven't run one since because it was so bad. It just was like, it was last, last year's New York marathon. Like for some reason I went into it like, oh, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to get a PR. It's going to be amazing. By mile three, I just. I was like, oh my God, I'm done. Like I'm at mile three. I feel like crap. I, I want to walk off the course. I don't know how to walk off the course. I don't know how to quit. I actually logistically don't know how to quit this. Um, so in a marathon, in a road marathon, I felt like the negative thoughts were just consistent. It was 
just quit, just quit, just quit, just quit. Like every step, because all you're doing is you're looking around and seeing tens of thousands of other people who are running by you and you have all of this. It's just a constant barrage of negative thoughts because it's just, you're just surrounded by it. You're basically caught in your own head, you know? The difference in an ultra, I feel like you have more time to yourself and you have so many other things to distract you. So your mind is telling you to quit, but then you can kind of focus on, well, this view is pretty amazing. Mm. The, well, I'm looking at the ocean right now. Like, how does that, how is that even possible? Or I just climbed up that mountain behind me. You turn around, you look, and you realize you just came over three mountains. So you have these things that can kind of pull you out of the negative thought process. So it's not a consistent, like, you're not going to do this. You're not going to do this. It's more of a, you're not going to do this. But this is kind of a cool moment, right? You know, maybe I should have something to eat. Ah, you're not going to do this. Well, look at that person's shoes. What the hell were they thinking wearing those? <laughs> yeah. You know, you have those type of thoughts that kind of pull you out of the negative. And, it, and everyone says this about ultra too. Just because you're at a low point, it's temporary. It doesn't mean you're going to be at a low point for the rest of the race. In fact, it's almost proven that the low point is temporary and you will become, uh, you will climb out of it sooner than you think. It could just be on the next downhill. You know, maybe your body just needs a downhill and all of a sudden the race is is back to normal. Mm -hmm. So there's just more positive things. There's like better ways to positively spin, I think, uh, your your mental um, uh, mental problems in, a, in an ultra, at least in my experiences. No, I think that makes sense. And actually, I, don't, I know this is based off a um, video, so it, a marathon video, so it might be completely wrong, but it kind of reminds me of that. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. It's a YouTube video where there's a they're talking about a guy's marathon and it's a cartoon and he's like, my, it's like mile one. And then it shows the guy being like, yay, this is so much fun. And then it's like right. mile three. And then, it, you know, he's like, oh, why am I doing this? And it goes through. Yeah. And, you know, I always watch that and I thought, I don't really like remember those thoughts because to me, once it hurts, it hurts. And it's just yeah. like, ow, ow ow, ow, like, con like you said, continuous. Whereas I felt like kind of, uh, to me, an ultra seems like it is like that video where it's like, oh, why am I doing this to myself? And then five minutes later, like, oh, look, a squirrel, like, you know, yeah. kind of just <laughs> like you said, distracting kind of how that video is. Sorry, uh -huh. way off on a tangent there, but just kind of came to mind. Um, so then next question is, if so would you say someone should go for a 50k first or is it worth kind of like, because that extra six miles might, I say only, uh, be, you know, another six miles, it's, you're still in that marathon mentality, whereas a 50 miler, you like switch over to an ultra mindset, or would you say, go with the 50k first and maybe make it a trail 50k and then, and then go off to the next step of the 50 yeah, that's that's kind of an ongoing discussion amongst ultra runners. Uh, you'll hear varied stories from people who who've done, you know, they do three fifty Ks before they do their first fifty miler, they do three fifty milers before their first hundred K. You know, they kind of build up that way. And then you hear other people are like, Oh, I, I never ran a marathon, I just ran fifty miles once. And you're just like <laughs> well, one, why? And two, how? <laughs> uh, so I'm of the mindset where it's I like kind of building up. Uh, just for the confidence side of things, I know it, the mental game in an ultra is is huge. So to be able to go into another distance jump, but having that experience of running a couple distances uh, lower is always really beneficial. A 50k will seem daunting at first, uh, especially coming from a marathon. You're like it's six miles difference, but the you know what if it's a trail marathon or a trail uh, 50k? Then you have the elevation gain in the mountains and stuff, so that adds a new dynamic. Or if there's weather involved. So I like, you know, little bites. So choose a 50, I'm out of the mindset of like, choose a 50K, choose one that's near you, choose one that's in a, a familiar location or something that inspires you or is beautiful. There's, there's tons of 50Ks to choose from, many of which went, run through some of the most epic and beautiful uh, parts of the world. So you can choose these uh, destinations, run your 50K, get incredible views and, you know, have all this amazing happiness uh, kind of fill your your mind and your body during the course of the race and help you finish. And then, you you know, if you decide to build up distances from there, you can always do that down the road for sure. Okay, cool. Very helpful advice there. Um, and uh, so to go back to Ginger Runner, I didn't mean to go so far off topic there, but I thought we'd kind of roll with it while we had it. Hey, I, I live and breathe this stuff, so you're never too far <laughs> off. I'm always a Ginger Runner. So it's, 
It's totally fine. <laughs> okay. Well, this is, yeah. So Ginger Runner, you know, obviously a large part of that is, you know, you, um, you know, you do these ultras, you do the, you know, reviews for products for ultras and things like that. But <laughs> so once it started to come together, when did you kind of realize that this was, this could be a business and, you know, a, a way of like really taking off? Was there a point you remember thinking like, wow, like this is getting really big, like kind of almost like, why do people want to, you know, watch me run around? Or did you ever have that time where you were kind of like, whoa, this is huge? It's when I started to get more and more emails from people uh, talking about how some video I posted got them to sign up for their first 50K or sign up for their first 50 mile or their first ultra uh, or to even get up off the couch. Um, early on, I still get them occasionally, but early on there were emails that were, uh, people who hadn't run in years, but saw some running video that I made, whether it was from a marathon or from a trail race, and they just got inspired to do to do something with you know with their own fitness. And so, after years of not running, they decided to finally take it up again. And when you get those kind of emails, you can't help but go, "What the hell am I doing? Like, how is this possible?" People are being inspired by what I'm doing, but I'm sitting here reading these emails. And all I want to do is go outside and run because they're inspiring me. And when I realize that there is this, this amazing cyclical sort of loop of inspiration, it, it, was, it was an obvious choice for me to make the full dive into Ginger Runner because it, it was the first time in my adult life where I felt really good with what I was doing, like really, really proud of what I was doing. Um, being a graphic designer and an art director and like having that nine to five was a, was a great job. And I had a great creative outlet doing that. Uh, being an actor was fantastic. Um, it, it gave me exactly what I needed, which was perspective. And, uh, when this started happening, it just, it, it kind of dawned on me. I'm happy doing this. I'm, I'm the happiest I've ever been. And, uh, the community that we're building here is pretty amazing. If I can make this a full-time job. I have to, I have to take the shot, take the chance. I'm going to be poor. Uh, that's totally fine. Money's not everything. And, uh, that's basically the last three years have been just like making ends meet, but at the same point, never having been this happy. Like it's just been this incredible, incredible journey. Uh, I would recommend anyone do. <laughs> I don't know how to describe like, Hey, go start a YouTube channel grow red hair uh, and create all the content and quit your day job. Uh, but it's, it's just been this, it's been a blessing. It's been incredible. Mm -hmm. I love that. And that's ex actually exactly how I feel about this podcast. Like I, you know, it isn't, isn't a chore and it is enjoyable. And uh, you know, the connections you make with, with the community, which is a wonderful community as it is, is, mm -hmm. is very special. And uh, you know, it's, it's nice to hear, someone else talking about that same kind of thing that I've, I've talked about for a long time. And how much do you think of videos kind of played into that? Do you think um, you would have had the same amount of connection with people had you used just written blog posts? Do you think it's the video no. allow people to connect with you on a deeper level? For sure. Um, I, as I mentioned, I'm just not a good writer and I've always been a performer. So I've always done, I, I I've gotten my best, my best fulfillment, my most, fulfilling memories were on stage in front of a live audience. And I still have those memories. They're visceral uh, when you have that direct engagement with, with an audience as a performer. And so with Ginger Runner, it, in my mind, I'm still trying to like figure out what's the best way to create content that is immediate. And there is an audience that I can interact with directly. And for me, having a video background, having an editing background and a graphics background, uh, I'm able to create pieces of content that I feel we kind of take things to the next level as far as production quality, but also inspire people. And you can see the comments of uh, on all the videos and it is this kind of direct interaction. And then you add on those live shows, you know, the live podcast that we do is even taking that to the more technological um, uh, front line where the interaction between the audience and our guests is live and right there in real time. And it is kind of utilizing the video side of things, but also with, with, new technology, you know, being able to interact with these people live. And uh, yeah, I don't think I could do anything like that on a written platform. Um, so the visual side of things, it's, it's key. And it's, it's really helped 
at least for me feel like I'm engaging with the audience more. No, I, I could definitely get, and especially like if you say that, and I'm sure they feel it even more. And um, for those of you listening, um, Ethan and I are talking via Skype right now, like video as well. And I always like to do the podcast through videos because I just feel like it's more of a conversation and a connection. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that just, uh, you know, reinforces that even more. Just so, so everyone knows, Tina's wearing a scream mask right now. It's, it's <laughs> yep. very, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's my go-to, you know. That's how I get in the, uh, what, what would you say as an actor? Get in the... Uh, get into the, uh, in the into role. The scene, into the character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there you go. <laughs> um, so then, Ginger Run Alive, tell, tell us, or people who don't know what that is exactly. So you said about, you know, having a guest, but what, what could people expect if they tune into that? Yeah, um, it kind of, a couple of years ago, it evolved as something, uh, a live show that I really wanted to do. And I've done live shows in the past on my comedy channel where we had guests come in and it was really fun. The immediate interaction was, was great. So I thought, how can I bring this into the running world? So we started bringing in uh, various ultra runners with, with stories, whether it's a, they just won a race the last weekend or it's someone from the mid pack uh, who just ran a really difficult 50 miler or something. And uh, bring them onto the show and allow the audience, the live viewers, to ask questions directly of that person, which is kind of a unique thing in the sense that we had Ryan Hall on the show. And uh, just being at the level he is, not many people get a chance to interact oh, yeah. with Ryan Hall or ask him a question. Um, so that was just a really cool moment to see people who have been in the chat room every single Monday ask a question and then being able to ask Ryan that question live on air. It's this really... It, it basically shrinks the world down to uh, literally your keyboard. Um, it's it's pretty neat. So being able to do that, I think, is unique. And uh, it's been fun. Every Monday, you know, we bring on a new guest and ask him a whole series of weird, random questions and then uh, uh, allow the audience to interact with him directly, too, which is pretty cool. Okay. So what time is that on a Monday for anyone listening? Every Monday, at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Okay. Oh, you're getting... Re I'm, in, I'm in America, so I'm okay. But all my English listeners, you've just ruled them out because it's probably... What that we be? get... I, well, I know. 11, not too bad. Yeah. It's, it's, that's the downside of oh. doing the live show mm -hmm. is that it will work for one audience time yeah. zone. Yep. Pretty much that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and it usually will... I'll adjust the time for the guest. So sometimes the guest is an East Coaster or you know, we're, I'm working on getting some European runners on That'll be interesting because it'll, it has it's to be good 2 for them. I think. Yeah, it'll be whenever I'll wake up for them, you know, so um, <laughs> uh, we'll adjust the time of the show to meet their needs. And it'll be interesting because, yeah, it's, it's a live show. So you don't get the luxury <laughs> of what you and I, we were yeah. able to schedule this, yeah. you know, what worked for both of us. So we don't have that luxury, which yeah. kind of sucks sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and anyone listening, I definitely encourage you to go check that out. Um, I will put links in the show notes, which I guess I should mention now, which will be at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC129. So I'll put links to all of these things we talk about. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about before we get on to the final kick round is, you know, you're kind of known for being honest, kind of like saying things how they are, and people listening know that I'm very much the same way. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is so rare on the internet on this online world of people kind of showing things as they are rather than only showing the positive which you quite often see you know we're kind of almost afraid to show that we are struggling or going through a rough patch i i have this amazing ability to see through i'm gonna swear can i swear yeah i'll say i'll i'll put, a, it's, it's I'll put late an asterisk enough. yeah i'll put an asterisk <laughs> Uh, I, I feel like I have a pretty decent ability to see through bull crap. I'll say crap. Um, I, it's an alarm that goes off in my head when I see something, when I read something, when I watch something. Uh, in this day and age, what a lot of people may not realize, I've worked in social media consistently for a decade. And just seeing it evolve from, from nothing, from its intimacy into what it is now this is the first time I've t really talked about this in any real public forum, which I'm excited about. Um, people are bought. There are opinions that are bought. There are photos that are bought. There is money being exchanged behind the scenes in so many instances that it, it's kind of gross. Uh, and especially as a gear reviewer, um, there are reviews out there of the same products that I review that I watch. And I sit there with my head in my hands 
knowing that they were either bought by the company itself or by a marketing company, which comes in and says, hey, we should review these six products that we have from these different brands. We'll pay you, you know, $500 to $1,000 per video, depending on how many clicks and blah, blah, blah. I get emails on the daily of companies doing this and refuse all of them because I care more about being blunt and being honest and getting that real opinion out there than any of the bull crap opinions. So if anything, if there's any message I can pass on to your listeners, it's put that filter on. Make sure that make sure that you know that maybe something you're reading or seeing is not the whole truth, because, yeah, people will hide all of their flaws uh, behind a mask of happiness and glory. Like they'll put, Instagram is a perfect example. Mm-hmm. There are Instagram accounts of people who look like they're living the best life mm-hmm. ever, traveling to the most exotic destinations and, you know, feet kicked up in a hammock in front of a crystal blue water holding, holding uh, like a coffee, an iced coffee. That photo was probably paid for by the coffee or the resort that they're staying at or the swimsuit that they're in. You don't know. And uh, there's a lot of shady stuff going on behind the scenes that is that is hiding honesty. So I am I am forward in this in in saying that I am 100 percent honest all of the time because I don't want that bullcrap money. I don't I don't want it. I don't want to be bought by a company Uh, as as I'm it sounds like you're the same way. Yes, that's why all of my content is funded by the viewers. So there's a Patreon website which allows viewers to contribute. It's all paid for by them. That way I don't have to deal with any brands whatsoever. I can literally just shake off all that uh, all that bull crap. Mm-hmm. Don't have to deal with it. Oh, no. I ever, Anyone listening who's known me for a while knows I feel the same way as you. I mean, I get Good. companies emailing me all the time saying, will you try out our product? And I say, yeah, sure, I'll try it. But if I don't like it, I'm going to tell you that I don't like yeah. it. Or I can put it out to the world that I don't like it because I'm not going to say I do when I don't. And then the same thing, we have um, this podcast, you know, the, the income I get for this podcast as it is a free product is sponsors. But I only, I, we get lots of uh, companies email us, but I only accept that company if I believe in the product and actually yep. feel yep. proud to represent them. So, you know, anyone listening, I totally agree with everything Ethan just said. And he's right. Like if someone does kind of put out this image of being like, oh, you know, I have this great life and I'm so happy and oh, this wonderful thing just happened to me, that wonderful thing. But then they disappear for three months and then they come back up again. Oh, this wonderful thing happened. Yeah. Oh, but I re- went through a really bad struggle. But they don't mention anything during the time. Then, you know, yeah. you, you've got to be careful. So, um, you know, and, and if you that's you too, try and, you know, don't be afraid to show your vulnerability. I think that actually shows a lot of courage being able to show that you are vulnerable. So, um, you know, don't be afraid of that either. And that's good. I'm glad to hear you yeah. say that. It, it's it's honesty will it, it it benefits no one when you're dishonest. Mm-hmm. So especially with gear reviews, if I'm reviewing a product that I have problems with, I always say what my problems are with that product because it benefits no one if I just sit there and say, oh, this thing is good at this and it's good at this. You should go buy it. It benefits no one. It doesn't benefit the brand. It doesn't benefit the the consumer. As a consumer, I'd much rather be educated going into a, a financial decision like purchasing new gear, knowing what the flaws could potentially be. And maybe, you know, that's something, that's a decision I have to make, whether I'm willing to to do that sacrifice. And I'll tell you, there are brands that are very upset when, when, when I'm honest. And I kind of revel in that fact. I kind of revel that some brands now no longer want to send me gear. I still get, I still buy the gear so I can review it, but uh, it happens. And mm-hmm. you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, I got to be honest, and uh, there's not many people that are doing it. I'm glad that you are. That's I fantastic. Am. I am, definitely. Good. Let's okay. continue to spread that. Let's spread that honesty. Oh, so I'm people... trying. And yeah. anyone listening, you join us. Let's make a Please. movement of this. We, we need yes. to come up with a hashtag or something. <laughs> a hashtag weapon. full honesty or full, honesty. full disclosure or something. <laughs> yeah. um, well, okay, random question. Are you an Apple product lover? Do you like yeah, that? I, yeah. All right, For the so most... then if, if, you, if you're honest... Thoughts on the seven? Because I oh. can't decide. <laughs> okay. Oh, that, that thing, gave me my answer. <laughs> I, yeah, like, I ordered one. Okay. For two reasons. One, my phone is old and it it's it's literally coming what, apart. What, is the 6S? It is, no, it's before that. It's, <laughs> I think it's two and a half old. Okay. Six. I'm very lucky to have a six. Okay. <laughs> and I know that you probably have listeners, global listeners. So, yes, I'm, I'm definitely privileged. I get to have a new phone after two years. That being said, it's coming apart. Uh, I did a live stream where I actually 
fixed my phone. I had to replace the screen. So I did a live stream of me replacing the screen myself because I'm frugal. Uh, and it was a two hour disaster, but it worked and in the end. I needed a new phone, so I was excited about the 7, and I want to review it. So that's mm -hmm. the two part. One, I needed a new phone, and two, I'm going to review it because of the camera. So the camera yeah. to me is like, yeah. oh, this is going to be great. Yeah. Optical image stabilization, I'm stoked. So maybe I can run with my phone, and that's it. I don't have to carry another camera to film a run. So I'm going to try that. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Did you order the pods? Oh, hell no. <laughs> $150 for Bluetooth? No, no, no. <laughs> okay. My problem is that they, they took out the... I'm fine with them taking out the three and a half mil jack, the little headphone jack. The problem is that they did not give you an alternative to charging simultaneously yeah. listening through headphones. Yeah. So you can't yeah. do both. You have to get a, a, another separate dongle created by the third party. The fact that they did not incorporate wireless charging in addition to being able to plug in for headphones is like, mm -hmm. they made a huge Well, mistake. that's the rumor for the eight. So apparently Ugh, they're saving it up. So, so we'll dumb. See. But anyway. you, know, they, you know they were able to do it. They I just know, didn't yeah. Do. And so, yeah, Apple, definitely... Apple a little, uh, they're a sneaky sometimes. So. Sneaky. Yeah. So yeah, I'll oh, throw some right. shit their way. This is yeah. not a, uh, not an Apple, Apple podcast here. So no, you're let's... not sponsored. There is no money being exchanged. <laughs> no, but Screw I do them. love my, I do love my Apple. So I'm yeah. going to say that, but any, if so, if any Apple, if Apple wants to sponsor this podcast, just... I'm all, all about it. <laughs> so we're not sponsored, but Hey, if you want to, Apple, <laughs> you gladly accept. Yep, exactly. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we are just going to take a moment to thank our sponsor, and then we will be back to the final kick. For years, we were told we needed to be hydrated, drinking gallons of water before we ran. And not only did that mean needing to pee every two minutes, but it was incredibly dangerous for our health, as runners suffered from hyponatremia. In step, the sugary, bright-colored syrups to save the day, right? Well, wrong, actually. Not only were they pumping us full of unnecessary sugar and calories we didn't want or need, but they are full of artificial ingredients. Blech. I've been using Enduropax for years now, and I can honestly say this is the perfect solution to this problem. Just spray Enduropax electrolytes into any drink and be on your way. It's flavorless, other than a slight lemony taste, of course. It has zero calories, no sugar, no artificial ingredients, and will replenish your electrolytes in a matter of seconds. I love Enduropack spray so much that during my marathons, I carry a bottle in my shorts and spray it directly into my mouth during the race. Visit Endurapax.com for more information and use coupon code Tina Muir for 10% off. All right, Ethan, I just have five more questions for you, which I'm really interested to hear your answers to these ones. Um, the first one is a little bit different. Uh, the greatest advice you've ever received? Start slow, run slower. So mm. this, is, this is advice that I got early on. When you are tackling a new challenge, I'm not going to say this for, let's say this is your seventh marathon or you're going for a PR. This is something for me that anytime I tackle something new, whether it's a new uh, distance uh, or a new um, uh, mountainous range or some sort of uh, new stage race or something, start slow, run slower. I always get caught up in that initial push. And this happens a lot in road marathons too. You just get caught up in whatever wave you start in. And you end up going too, too fast and you can easily ruin your race in the first 20 minutes. Uh, so I always, this is something I learned uh, long ago. Someone told it to me. I was like, I like that. I'm sticking with it. And that's to start slow and run slower. Just because you, just because you start slow doesn't mean you're actually running the pace you need to be running. Oh yeah. So it's just to kind of remind yourself to, to take it easy for the first bit, mm -hmm. then yes. crank it up later. Especially as it feels easy usually in those first few miles. Absolutely. Okay, um, favorite running book or blog other than your own? Oh, man. Yeah, oh, yeah, my own, for sure. Uh, <laughs> I really, you know, Born to Run, everyone says Born to Run in, in this sort of thing. I, I'm i fascinated by that book uh, because when I read it, I, I was early on in my sort of delving into ultra so I would definitely say uh, that book as well as Ultra Marathon Man. I mean, Dean Carnassus, who mm -hmm. I've come to know now uh, as a friend, and it's weird to even think that, that, I, that we've met. He's been on the show a couple times, and he's just a really nice guy. Mm -hmm. um, he's done some pretty amazing things in the ultra world, and reading his books, he's a great storyteller. And being able to read his books, they're just page turners, right? They're just real easy to read, digestible content, but it's it's... You, every time you finish a book that he's written, you just want to go out there and run forever. You want to mm -hmm. just strap shoes on and just go. 
So I, I love that one because when I read it, it made me want to run Western States. Mm -hmm. Great. Yep. And uh, that's funny. You mentioned Dean and uh, Born to Run. I mean, I can't even believe the amount of people that say that book. I mean, I'd probably say a quarter of my guests say Born to Run. But we have, I've had, uh, you mentioned about Dean, but uh, Chris has become a friend of mine. I've had him twice on and he's same kind of thing. Just very like easy to talk to, just funny uh. and yeah, it's, 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 again, what we were talking about earlier about you see, like you were mentioning Ryan Hall, it's like, uh, you realize like, wait, these people don't have someone to like type on the computer for them? Like what? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so <They're> real humans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, good, uh, good to hear yet another one as I haven't, I haven't ever spoken to Dean. So it's good to know that he's yet another person that's easy to talk to. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, you might have already answered this one, but what would you tell a new runner? Uh, I think it's the same thing as if they're tackling their first marathon or, you know, they need to get over pre-race jitters or something like that. Um, start slow, run slower. Um, and I, I also say for new runners, nothing new on race day. I'm sure you've yes. told this advice on your show <laughs> many times. Uh, I've made the mistake a couple of times when you just kind of go, I thought I taught myself not to do this. Uh, but yeah, nothing new. And that goes for food too. So lead, like the days leading up to a race, not, you know, changing your diet too much or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, nothing yep. new. Nope. Great. Good advice. All right. Uh, what is your pre-race, pre-run meal? Pizza. Uh, I think it's, I think it's the same, uh, post-race as well. It's just, it's always pizza. The Have you had the pizza flavored gels? No. Uh, from Cliff? I don't know who makes them, but I've heard of, I've heard there are pizza flavored gels. So funny story. <laughs> uh, one of my friends, Ben, uh, had run with Scott Jurek before. Scott Jurek had a bunch of uh, cliff products that he was testing out one of which was this giant it's like a food pouch from cliff bar that was the pizza flavor so he gave my friend ben he's like hey you should try these flavors there's a whole bunch of them and then ben was like pizza so ben never used it jump mm -hmm. ahead six months ben and i were on a run and ben's like hey do you have any do you need any food or anything like that and i was like oh yeah you know i i don't think i have many gels with me he goes hey take this and he hands me the pizza uh, which he had never uh, used. He was just, because he's it sickens him, right? So uh, he gave it to me. He basically re-gifted to me. Uh, I didn't eat it. It is still in my car currently. <laughs> okay. Is it a gel or is it something different? It's like a food pouch. Like those like um, applesauce food pouches that you oh, get at okay. you know, a Starbucks or something like that. It's like that, but full of, I'm guessing, pizza. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm not, not confident enough to try it. So it is I wouldn't want to eat, especially now after it's been in your car if, in the summer. I'll send it to you. You're welcome to try it. Or <laughs> Let's just it. pause it around. <laughs> yes. you know. I'll, I'll eat it during my first ultra. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. And the interesting one, I can't wait to hear answer this, your favorite running product. Okay. So this is, a, this is definitely a, a tough one for me to answer mm -hmm. because I think the two products I'm going to talk about, they're very, they're expensive. And it's not because they're expensive that I'm choosing them, but I'm going to, I'm going to tell you why. Uh, the first of, I'm going to show, I was like, I'm going to show you, but, uh, no, it's not the, <laughs> iPhone. it is my running watch. Okay. And when I started, I was running with a Gar Garmin forerunner. Ugh, I think it was a forerunner 210. That was the biggest purchase I'd ever made in running related gear. And I think it was like a couple hundred bucks. And I used that thing religiously. I used it for walks, runs, you know, heart rate, all that stuff. So my latest uh, infatuation is with my my Ambit Three Peak, which is my um, ultra running watch. This is a GPS enabled, basically altitude everything you could want in a watch. It's it's in there. Um, I have worn the crap out of this thing, and it got me through my first hundred miler with ease. And it's I've used it for years. I've reviewed other watches since this watch, and I still go back to this watch. So I think it's six hundred dollars. You can get it for a lot less than that now. Um, and it, I've used it almost every day for like three years. So okay. I, it's definitely up there. The second device, if you're not in the market for a watch, uh, I recommend if you are in the market for like a hydration pack is my Solomon 5L. It's my Solomon S lab 5L hydration pack. I wear it of all the hydration packs I've reviewed, which are pl a plenty. Um, it is the only one that actually conforms to the human body and, uh, has worked in every race scenario that I've ever run in. So, okay, great. Yeah, those Very are my helpful. two pieces of gear. 
All right. And I'll put uh, links to that in the show notes. And anyone uh, listening, when you do your first ultra, as Ethan has inspired you, you can uh, check that one out. <laughs> I have reviews of all this stuff, too. Okay, great. Yeah. And uh, all right. So then that was going to be my next question. Just uh, places, you know, obviously, gingerrunner.com. Uh, where else can people follow you, find you that you'd like to mention? Yeah, the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the ginger runner. That's I, I go there. That's where all the films are. That's where all the reviews are. Um, the website's a great hub. There's links, you know, to other websites. Um, but YouTube is, yeah, you're going to, I hope that people would go to the YouTube channel and just sit there and watch and spend, you know, six hours watching through running videos and race recaps and, films and reviews and stuff like that. I hope that they are entertained enough to uh, indulge in six hours of watching my ugly mug do <laughs> stupid things. And if you're not, then you can leave him some honest comments. That's yes, what we please. learned. Honest comments Love saying honesty. how much they hate you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, to those, I get a couple of those uh, a month and I embrace it. I embrace the trolls. So bring yep. it. Yep. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Ethan. This was so much fun and I really enjoyed getting to know you more and I'm sure everyone else did. So make sure you check out um, gingerrunner.com and the YouTube channel. Um, and I'll put links to all this in the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC129. So thank you, Ethan. Thank you. Honored. I really appreciate you having me on, Tina. Thank you. <laughs> How funny is he? You can see why he's a comedian. <laughs> I was laughing my way through the whole episode. And I love that he's so honest and not willing to be bought by companies, nor is he going to allow bullies to define who he is. He makes his own rules, and I love that. If you've not checked out Ginger Runner, make sure you do, and you'll probably end up spending hours there. So last week I told you that the 2016 Run to the Top survey is now available, and many of you have already filled it out, so thank you so much for taking the time to do that and for your feedback so far been really interesting to hear your thoughts and some of your responses were not what I expected so thank you so much for your honesty and for your kindness. For those of you who missed last week's episode you can find the survey at runnersconnect.net forward slash listen. Your feedback will really help me to improve this podcast and make our new mini coaching episodes tailored to you. I am loving the ideas you guys are coming up with for the name of this new podcast, and I think I'm going to have a really hard time picking between them. So if you do fill that out, it will just be really helpful for me so that I can answer your questions on the show. So once again, the link is runnersconnect.net forward slash listen. If you did enjoy this episode, sharing it with friends, family, or anyone you think would be interested is just so helpful to me. The more people we can get to subscribe and download, that means I can bring on bigger and better guests. And the show has already grown by 200% since we relaunched in 2015. So I want to thank you for your loyalty and time. That truly means so much to me. Next week, we're going to be talking to two-time Olympian, uh, founder and CEO of RunGum, Nick Simmons. Um, It was a great interview. And as most of you know, Nick is very honest. He's an elite runner, um, but he's very, very to the point and doesn't mind sharing some things. So I know you're really going to enjoy that one. So make sure you tune in next Wednesday and I hope you have a great week.